I want to start by reading you um, an article, and you could let me know if these articles resonate with you in terms of how it affects us, in terms of how it affects our health, the environment. So I want to read you an article, and then you can give me your thoughts if you have any on it. This is an article from March 5th, 2015, from mangabay.com. Um, this one says, humans cause erosion 100 times faster than normal. It says, experts have long linked deforestation and intensive farming to worsening erosion rates around the world. Although studies extensively determining erosion rates due to human-induced activities have rarely been quantified by scientists. However, new research conducted by geologists finds that erosion rates in the southeastern United States increased 100 times after the arrival of European colonists in the 1700s due to tree clearing and unsustainable agricultural practices. Um, that's it. I'm not going to read the rest of you. You want to comment on that? Any thoughts on that? Is this on? Oh, okay. Um, I can start with that. I actually wrote a whole book about that subject. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, and I'm familiar with that study. I, th I think it, it's, right, it's spot on. Um, the problem that many societies have had, and I'll be talking about this uh, tomorrow at some length, so I'll try and keep it short tonight, but the, um, the basic problem with plow-based agriculture, what I like to call really conventional agriculture, before we had the conventional agriculture we call conventional agriculture now, plow-based agriculture was conventional in many parts of the world, and that caused erosion to race ahead of soil production in region after region. And the American Southeast uh, is one of those areas where post-colonization erosion rates really went through the roof. And geologists have, there's been a number of studies through the years that have quantified this, but geologists have new tools now to actually put more solid numbers on those estimates. And the study you're referring to is sort of the, one of the latest examples of a really good case study that shows the degree to which sort of long-term slow soil loss at a pace that in any given year may be kind of hard to, to measure and recognize, something that would happen on the order of, say, a millimeter a year. I'll show you some further data tomorrow on that. Um, but you let that run long enough, and it can really add up. Um, that happened in New England. It happened in the American Southeast. It actually shaped a lot of the early history and social evolution of this country. And if you go farther back in history, you can trace it to other countries. And I'll pick that up again tomorrow. Uh, hi, it's good to be back. Nice to be here. It's funny, I was just thinking about soil erosion and picturing, I have, I have some statistical things to say and rational things to say, but, the, but I was just thinking, I, was li I used to live on the Mekong River and the Mekong River looks like a latte, you know, going by. It's just completely, it's this, it's this soil, you know. I mean, on the, I'm, I was just picturing how the rivers of the world just strip the land of soil and carry it out to sea. And there are natural processes, but when you mention, Stephen, the um, deforestation, that's one of the most egregious as well, and says unsustainable agricultural practices. But I, I wanted, my reaction to that is, is that it's a matter of scale that what we're doing now with the rising population and declining um, land base is we're, we're, over, we're over practicing agriculture and over, over deforesting and doing it all in the wrong ways. And the reason for that is, is that we don't see, you know, we're not taking into account the effect of what we're doing. We're not saying, you know, we're saying we need these trees or we need this field to grow some food. This is very short-term thinking. So what I want to do tonight is, in my work as a writer, is to try and connect the dots and say, what are all the other aspects of the problem that we also need to be paying attention to? Because if we're just thinking about it in terms of what we're going to gain from the forest or gain from the field and not looking at how the runoff affects the rest of the, the, um, the material, then um, the world, then that's going to be, you know, that's, that short-term thinking is one of, the, one of the systemic problems behind the kind of soil erosion we're getting. I'm a big fan of John Jevons. I don't know if you know John. Um, and he, he, he taught me that uh, it takes 500 years to grow one inch of soil. And uh, he's a big about growing soil. So I always tell my grandchildren when I garden with them, we're not just growing food. We're not just even making compost. We're growing soil. And, and I live in an area, a forested area, where I'm constantly putting out 
um, cover crops, even in the forest areas, and just constantly feeding them and feeding them. So we've talked a lot about the food system, and we forget about the food system of the earth, and that we need to refeed that that six inches of life-giving soil that covers this planet. So we feed ourselves, but remember to also feed the earth. You know, and and what what are the practices in your own life that you can do that? Um, John Jevons also says that there's only 36 to 52 years of farmable soil left on the planet if we continue the practices we're, we're doing today. So this is an urgent matter. Well, as a physician, uh, I would have said many years ago that this is uh, either above my pay grade or out of my <laughs> realm <well>. of understanding. <laughs> but I did grow up on a farm, a 40-acre farm in southern Missouri that was trying to be self uh, subsistence that that we had everything that we needed kind of farming and uh, and I do live in the city now um, with a, a lot that part of the lot has absolutely no earthworms and a part of it has one or two per inch and I try to understand from who's lived there before and how they lived why that would be and of course I was fascinated by the lecture this morning by David about uh, taking some soil less soilless lot which many subdivisions create. I've watched them dig up all the topsoil, all of it, and take it away to sell as topsoil, and then um, bring in an inch and put it back so that maybe some grass will grow. And I think uh, combining what people have said uh, in the couple of days I've been here, like, like Gwen Olson was saying at summarizing her talk, that we need to, to, be edu to educate ourselves, and then we need to get some experience like you're fixing your backyard, and then we need to become active if we care about uh, all these things. And so when people go through the experience, as we have done in Rockford, Illinois, with a lifestyle change program, and people have a change, it's like a, 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 some kind of a spiritual experience or some kind of a revelation to them that the world is, just works differently than they knew. And now they want to know how to engage in this process. And so uh, I, I loved what we've seen here today. There's people that are starting with their backyard. And they're starting, I think about the t years when we put the garbage in the garbage disposal. It was such a convenient new attachment to our kitchen. And, uh, and we need to put all of that garbage back on the garden or in the forest or wherever. And so the leaves that we bag and they carry to the landfill and the, the grass that we uh, bag and someone takes it away, all that is precious future soil. And so what I feel as a, as a physician working in lifestyle change is that we need to expand rapidly from learning one thing into its connectivity to everything else and then pick an area that, that, that gives us energy, feeds our passion, and become active in that uh, for the good of the earth. And um, what's good for the human turns out to be good for the earth. So uh, that's, that's where I end up. You know, um, can I just add to what you just said here? Uh, my community, Marin County, California, provides uh, an extra can. They have the waste can, and they have the recycling can, and then they have a green can. And you can put your food waste and your yard waste in it, and they take it away, and they compost it, and then they provide free compost and free to, to all the community members. So if you want to find out about that and have your community do that too, that would be a good, a good step to take. Uh, one more thing, Steve. Uh, we have several food deserts in our community where people would have to be on a bus a couple hours in order to get real food uh, with their kids or, or with the, if they're a caregiver for an older person, they'd have to go to. Uh, and so we've started community gardens, and the city provides uh, money for people to start community gardens, and they're often taking vacant lots and turning them into uh, producing soil and producing crops, and the people in the neighborhood come and work in the garden, and then they can take the food. And uh, a lot of this going on in Detroit, many other places. It, where it's going on so many places, it's hopeful. Planting of trees, so many uh, arbor days, it's hopeful. But the job we have to do is so big, uh, it's going to take more of us. There, there's also um, 
pretty good examples of innovative farmers in all parts of the world who are tackling both the problem of soil erosion and also the problem of maintaining soil fertility. And if you think about maintaining the long-term productive capacity of the land to support societies, we've got to really protect both over the long run. We've got to keep soil on the land where it belongs, but we also have to keep it in a state where it is fertile enough and that fertility is maintained to be able to sustain repeated agricultural production. And throughout history, we have, we have a long history in many parts of the world of essentially mining soil or soil fertility to support a society. And eventually, the sort of clock runs out on that and, and the resilience of a society gets sapped. Um, so the challenge, I really think, for the next 30, 50, 100 years um, is to figure out how to uh, develop farming systems for applicable in all the world's economies and climates and soil types that actually regenerate and maintain soil fertility even as we use it to intensively grow crops. And that's a serious challenge, but I think there's farmers who are pointing the way, who are doing that today, that can help point the way uh, forward in terms of where we need to go. Stephen, can I ask sure. David a question? Sure. <laughs> um, I often hear about temperatures rising and sea level rising and glaciers melting and climate change, and I think people don't talk about uh, soil as much, soil temperature and soil moisture. Can you speak to what we're going to be losing as, as this shift is happening? Well, oh, the, the, there's a couple projections that I've seen. Uh, one relates just to crop production and rising temperatures, and the rule of thumb that I think I remember is that for every one degree C of global temperature rise, the production of key grain crops that we use today, things like wheat, corn, and rice, will drop by 10%. So if you get a one degree, you lose 10%, you get three degrees, you lose 30% in terms of yields. Um, but that doesn't directly answer your question, which was about soil temperatures and moisture. Um, there's been, um, you know, several years of fairly unusual drought in the American Midwest, for I live example. In, I live in California. You're in Cal okay. Well, so you're in the kind of the worst of it right now. I used to live there, but then I got a job elsewhere. Um, the <laughs> Rainy Washington, lucky yes, you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we're, we're not hurting for water yet. Um, but if you look at um, some of the farming practices that people have been adopting in the western part of the plains, which have been pretty dry now for a few years in a row. Yeah. The farmers that are leaving crop stubble on their land and going to no-till methods, you know, and some of them are chemical intensive, some of them are very low chemical use. There's a broad spectrum among no-tillers. But the thing that's in common is that their soil temperatures are lower and their moisture retention is better. They argue that they're keeping an extra inch to three inches of moisture retained in the soil that isn't evaporating out of it. Right. So there's, you know, that there's ways that we may be, some of the ways that we could adapt our agricultural practices to rebuild soil life and maintain the soil itself may help us with some of those problems. Of course, the best way to help with those problems is to reduce the problem in the first place. Right. <laughs> um, the, the second best way may be to try and figure out creative ways to adapt to it, and the best of those methods may be ones that actually help us build healthier, more fertile soils at the same time. And so I, there's cautious optimism at oh, some, okay. you know, Ways there. <laughs> okay, so this article might be repeating some of the things you've said, but it's got a <clears throat> strong title, so I want to read it anyway. This is from um, the Huffington Post Green from uh, December 2014, and its title is Topsoil Could Be Gone in 60 Years If Degradation Continues, UN Official Warns. Generating three centimeters of topsoil takes 1,000 years, and if current rates of degradation continue, all of the world's topsoil could be gone within 60 years, a senior UN official said on Friday. About a third of the world's soil has already been degraded. Maria Helena Simodo of the Food and Agricultural Organization told a forum marking World Soil Day. The causes of soil destruction include chemical heavy farming techniques, deforestation which increases erosion and global warming. The earth under our feet is too often ignored by policymakers, experts say. Soils are the basis of life, said Simoto, FAO's Deputy Director General of Natural Resources. 95% of our food comes from the soil. Unless new approaches are adopted, the global amount of arable and productive land per person in 2050 will be one quarter of the level in 1960, the FAO reported, due to growing populations and soil degradation. Soil plays a key role in absorbing carbon and filtering water, the FAO reported. Soil destruction creates a vicious cycle in which less carbon is stored, the world gets hotter, and the land is further degraded. We are losing 30 soccer fields of soil every minute, mostly due to intensive farming. 
Um, the basic message of that, I think, is true. Um, the broader message is that I think that you'll see that we're not actually literally going to run out of topsoil in the next 60 years. And why would I say that? Because what it's going to mean is that agriculture is going to have to change before we do. <laughs> if you actually take the rates, um, David Pimentel back in 1995, mm -hmm. 20 years ago, estimated pretty much the same numbers. Um, in fact, that's probably the source for some of those numbers. I used his book, uh, his article for some sources in my book. Um, but if you look at the rate of global soil loss, topsoil loss off of agricultural fields, I think Pimentel uh, estimated we we're losing 0.7% a year, something like 23 billion tons, if I'm remembering the numbers right, of soil that's being turned into dirt, being moved out of place. Um, and if you take 0.7% a year, that doesn't sound like a big number until you run the math and go, oh, well, that just means in 150 years it goes down to zero. You would essentially wipe it out. The, I think the reason why we're not going to literally run out of topsoil is that as our population rises and the amount of arable land decreases, it's going to force changes in farming practices. The real question, I think, is how far ahead we can get of the curve and start restoring land, that one-third of global cropland that's been degraded and taken out of agricultural production since the Second World War, much of that could actually be restored with regenerative agriculture agricultural practices that could rebuild the soil. And if you look at the numbers for how long it takes to actually, for nature, to build an inch of soil, of whether it's 500 uh, years to make an inch or 1,000 years with the FAO estimate, um, you can compare that to how long does it take people to make soil. Anne made a couple inches in our yard in less than a decade. In other words, nature, as efficient as she is in many regards, isn't necessarily the most efficient builder of soil. Um, we can rebuild topsoil, I think, faster than nature can if we put our mind to it and we develop applications that return a lot of organic matter to the land. That, that issue of closing the loop on sort of nutrients um, is hugely important in terms of trying to rebuild soils globally. So I, I think what this, what this article gets at is that there's a really clear message in terms of the way we're going with agricultural production globally is not a long-term solution. It's going to need to change. And the discussion and arguments we really should be having as a global society are what direction we want it to change in and how to best ensure that we have the fullest agricultural productive capacity in this world that we can two, three, four, seven generations out. And we're simply not having that discussion at a policy level these days. You want to go? The only comment I have is that <clears throat> there is a, a website uh, called Peak Prosperity uh, by Chris Martinson. And in alternative investments section of that website and talking about the problem of, of losing land, there is an investment group in California that is buying up farmland using investors' money and it takes them three years to turn it from conventional farmland into organic farmland. And this whole process is being driven by the demand for organic food. And so things seem like they're changing slowly. Then it seems like there's a nidus of change. And before we know it, the whole world is talking about what we were just wondering about. So um, part of our our effort could be uh, to invest in groups that are turning conventional farmland back into to, uh, to, to soil and, and, and converting that to organic farming. There's always something that we can do, even if it's not on the front lines. So um, I take a very political point of view on this. Uh, there's so much we can do for our own health and for the health of the places where we live, but ultimately we're going to have to change the industrial agricultural system that we have. That's the big destroyer. I mean, it's really um, necessary. But, and, and one of the reasons I think the personal changes are good is, is that's where we learn what we need. That's where we get committed. But I, I want to urge everyone to try and make a decision to take that next political step. And the reason is, is that uh, when you look at the ravages of industrial agriculture, they mostly started after the, with, you know, you, you remember the pictures of the Dust Bowl and the, the loss of soil, and the government moved in at that point and helped them redo their, their 
plowing practices, so to speak, and, and, and helped with erosion control and, and helped control that, although, as I believe, they have never restored in much of that prairie that blew away at that time. Um, and and we, have this, we have this terrible scourge of toxic chemicals that are killing the soil from chemical agriculture. So after, after the government had that, had that sort of good deed, that was about the last good deed that happened as far as I'm concerned, after World War II, all of the chemicals that were used in the war were turned into toxic pesticides and herbicides and then sold to farmers and as if that's a good scientific thing to do to raise productivity all the way up until now where we have even more toxic technologies also that are affecting the soil as well as our own health. So it's really important to not see this as a separate issue that's out there somewhere and I can protect my health if I just eat healthy because we're living in a toxic soup. And this, this is constantly being, we're drenched in, in plastics and poisons and these things. We have to take political action. I'm also a, um, a Pimentel fan in the sense that he said that our agricultural system is one part food calories and nine parts oil. So I always used to say that, sort of like you just said, that, that as soon as, you know, peak oil and we run out of fossil fuels, our agricultural is going to have to change too. But, you know, I'm being kind of discouraged about that because I'm seeing this giant squeezing of the last few drops of, of oil and the last, of, the last few wonderful soils and stuff to, to continue the sort of lifestyle that we all have now or the, at least this production-based agriculture that we have now. There are real solutions. I gave them all in my talk. And, they're, and, you know, they're, they not only improve the health of ourselves and our communities, but they will make the changes that we need to make um, in terms of restoring the planet. There is no separation between our personal health and our planetary health. As I've become interested in e ecology and health, as opposed to just health, um, and health instead of just medicine, uh, I've joined some organizations, and now I will get these phone calls, and they'll say, I want you to vote to know that you could vote against House Bill number so-and-so, and do you have any questions about it? Do you understand it? And so we'll have this conversation, and, and I've paid my dues to be a member of this organization. So they call, and then she said to me, now your representatives are thus and so, and your senators are thus and so, would you like me to connect you to, with them now? And I said, yes. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, the work of being politically active, if you join the organizations that are doing the political action that you would like to do, it's much easier. Uh, on that note, I found the name and number of this organization that some of you might have an interest in. It's Farmland LP, which means limited partnership. Farmland LP Sustainable Organic Conversion. And the website is Craig, C-R-A-I-G, all in capitals, at farmlandlp.com. So uh, there just get to be more and more things we can do and easier to do it. And that, that three to five years to convert from now conventional to organic with roughly the same yields um, is, I keep, that keeps coming up in study after study that I've seen and people that I've talked to. That seems like a pretty robust thing. And to, to a geologist, five years is nothing. <laughs> that's, that's no time at all, right? But you know, in, in the political world, that's forever. It's off the planning horizon. Um, and so I think that the, the idea of actually trying to motivate change with political activity, making voices known that people want that kind of change is actually very important. Yeah. Because we have, this, we have opportunities and potential solutions that are kind of within our grasp, but we need social pressure to actually motivate the adoption of it. What we also need, though, frankly, is for it to make a lot of economic sense for individual farmers. And, you know, if, if it made sense for them to convert this year, they would, more of them would start thinking about it. So thinking of ways to sort of bridge the gap, if you will, uh, if, if we acknowledge that farming is going to change this century, and if we could all agree on what direction, which we might not, but, but if we could, there's still the question of how do you get farmers to actually engage and start and pull the trigger on that new equipment or that change or trying something different, um, which is the hardest thing for most people to do on most subjects. <laughs> 
Um, and so ways that societally we can help, we can subsidize, we can support with our consumer dollars. You know, there's various ways to try and help support that kind of conversion. Um, but I think that's the technol the conceptual and technological part of it. Big pieces of it are already on the table. We're not using all the tools that we may have because we're not unified and trying to know what direction we're going in. Well, I'll follow up. There's a enormous reform in farm subsidy programs, and they, our farm bill has to change. It's a hugely important part of the problem because we're subsidizing chemical agriculture. GMOs, agriculture would not exist without the farm subsidies that are now in existence. I covered a little bit in our talk, but I want to repeat one part. There have been a lot of experiments on what they call green payments because farming is a difficult job and you can't always get very good economics out of the situation, partly because of the way we've structured that. But um, in Europe, for instance, in the Netherlands, they have what they call the yardstick program. So they set targets for the farmers and they say, if you meet this target that there's no runoff of pesticides in the rivers around you, or you have so many bird nests on your dairy, or they set a, a conservation target, then the farmer figures out the way to meet those targets and, and they get the yardstick is you get payments they're called green payments, okay? So they're green subsidies. So we no, there's no reason why we can't have those kinds of conservation subsidies. We had some of them, the Farm Bill activists got some of them done um, in, a, in a re, the recent, not the most recent, but the Farm Bill before that. Unfortunately, the political atmosphere in Congress right now is so conservative and so rigidly you know, about agribusiness that they've withdrawn even the best efforts that we've been able to make, including, you know, re reforms to food stamp problems. So they're, so they're giving more money to agribusiness and less money even to people in the food stamp programs and social programs and conservation programs. So those are political changes that absolutely, if you need to go, um, the place to go is the Environmental Working Group. They have a huge EWG.org. They have wonderful you know, explanations of all of this and ways for you to call up your representatives and, and make your voice known on this. Yeah, EWG, environmentalworkinggroup.org. Thanks. Yeah, go for it. So this is a 10-day conference. It's quite long. And when the replay comes out, people are going to look at this and go, oh, let me decide what to watch, what's important. And not everyone has time to watch all 58, 90-minute things again. And when they see um, this panel or they see this topic, um, let me read you a headline from one of the stories from EcoWatch. It says, the documentary Seed points out that many irreplaceable seeds are nearing extinction. The future of seeds is at risk from biotech and industrial seed companies that control seeds through genetic modification and patents. So when these people go and they see the replay and they're busy and they got things going on and everything and they hear the topic of running out of seeds and they say, well, that really doesn't seem like a big deal. I only eat a few types of cucumbers and it doesn't really seem like a big deal that we don't have as many seeds. So what is the big deal? And as I mean, sure, it's nice to have a lot of varieties, but what's the real big deal? So what if we have you know, went from a thousand varieties of apples to five. Like, what, what's so bad about that? All right, I'll take you up on that one, Stephen. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, diversity, the short word answer, one word answer is diversity of our germplasm that sustains life on Earth. I used to say that seeds were our silent partners in, in, in helping life survive on Earth, but now I've heard so much about the gut and I've heard so much about soil, and I'm thinking that microbial life is really the, our most best silent partner. So I'm, I have to change my line on that one. But we do have all these silent partners that support life on Earth. And one of the ways is um, through a microbial and genetic diversity. So that when, when you have a disease or a pathogen come in and wipe out part of it, you've got plenty of other life forms that take over. I'm sure this happens in, in your work as well, right? So with seeds, you have to have, you have a corn blight, you have to have that, that seed of the corn that's resistant to the blight, you know, that comes along. So if you only have three or four seeds left, you, you're really stuck because you, it, you will be deprived of the, of the immune response of the earth, basically. This genetic diversity is the immune response of the earth where 
um, seeds growing in place. I talk in my talk about this 85,000 subvarieties of corn in the Oaxaca area of Mexico, where there's corn varieties that can do everything. They can withstand density and wind and drought. And there's even a corn variety that fixes its own nitrogen. So the soybean farmers will be unhappy about that if they knew. Um, but the point is, is that, is that in these seeds in response to stresses come up with a solution. So there's always a natural solution for almost everything that's the, that the earth can throw at us. And, and, and then embodied in the seed is that solution, as well as the knowledge of the people who cultivate the seed, and then the wealth of the, pl of the place to support the seed. So it's a, it's a whole system that when you, when you tend that system, when you're aware of the system and you can support it, uh, we've lost maybe 90%, 90% of the seed diversity of this earth. Especially, there's about 150,000 um, edible plants and about 40,000 of them are cultivated. And, um, but we only eat, most human beings, you know, we're, we're pretty selfish, we think that we run the earth, but you know, there's a lot of other life forms that eat aspects, lots of these other things. But we only eat, you know, maybe a couple of dozen uh, seeded plants. So uh, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty narrow uh, seed uh, structure that supports our food supply. And of those, but each one of those, there's maybe 140,000 varieties of rice, and there's, you know, so each one of those has a magnificent blossoming of its genetic diversity, but because of the way we live and farm, and because of the corporate control of the seed supply, and because of ignorance, to be honest with you, just one more thing. One of the things I really loved writing my book was meeting people who devoted their life to the pea. You know, these are people who are so devoted to one, one plant, you know, and they knew everything about that plant. Well, we've lost that because we've turned all of our science into the computational and other, other, the laboratory. You know, we've lost, we've lost the expertise of people who truly love what they work on. I, I think this is also, the loss of expertise is part of the problem. So if we don't know, like, you know, we have that genius of Luther Burbank who, 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 had, who could tell by looking at a plant, you know, that it was different. You know, we don't, we don't have that so much anymore because of our technological affection, <laughs> which is a kind way to talk about this terrible thing that we're doing. But, um, but so it's, I, I think it's not just the seed itself that we're losing. We're losing our love of the seed and we're losing our knowledge of the seed. And these things have to be brought back, which is why last night, was it last night? Which is why I encouraged when we were talking, I think, oh, in the first panel, Stephen, when we talked about how we educate children, I've been thinking about this ever since you asked that question, because I think the important thing in raising the next generation is to give them that sense of wonder that Rachel Carson talked about so that they can grow up loving the world that they're given and that they can then find their way forward. Yes, we need to inform ourselves and them of, and, and we need to protect them, but what if people didn't have a sense of wonder about this beauty and diversity that we've been given in creation, right? And so I think that's what children need to do so that they might grow up and say, I want to devote my life to the pea. That would be really nice. Um, this article somewhat relates, or I don't know if it relates, but it's on the same topic of some of the things that you've discussed, so I want to throw this in. Um, this is an article that says, and it's from a, an online website, so you can comment if you know anything about it. A new groundbreaking study led by researchers at the University of Helsinki Institute of Biotechnology in Finland recently published findings in the Journal of Movement that the gut microbiology of Parkinson's patients is significantly correlated with disease progression. Compared to the control group of relatively healthy persons, those with Parkinson's have vastly different gut bacteria. This is yet another important study that contributes to the not to be ignored notion that when the bacteria in our gut are not well or thriving harmoniously, the stage is set for disease. The takeaway message I cannot stress enough to my patients is securing gut health at an early age to help create a more protected epigenetic landscape. Now that this discovery has been made, researchers endeavor to understand how paying closer attention to gut microbiology in younger patients potentially predisposed to Parkinson's may play a crucial role in eventually helping to prevent disease from manifesting. 
Um, continuing on later, it says, lead researcher neurologist Dr. Flip Shepherdjans noted, our most important observation was that patients with Parkinson's have much less bacteria from the prevotelexaic family, unlike the control group, practically no one in the patient group had a large quantity of bacteria from this family. While researchers have not been pinned down why this is the case, they are following study participants to discover if gut microbiology changes and if potential changes can lead to improved prognosis. Any thoughts on that? Any? Well, we're at that stage now where there's been a great awakening uh, that the bacteria are outnumber us they've been with us forever some of them have become embedded in various body parts and actually become organelles uh, within us um, so you, we're entering that stage where everybody's going to be looking at every condition and looking at the normal versus the abnormal and what the dominant uh, bacterial species are and then from that they're going to do randomized control trials where they change the bacterial species uh, and you can get uh, laboratory animals that are sterile, have no bacteria in the gut, and you can then populate one kind or another kind and see what difference uh, that makes. We talked about some of that earlier today. So I think whatever our passion is, our interest is, we need to watch this research now very carefully because it's going to come very fast and furious. Uh, these studies are, are not long as long term as some other ones. And uh, we will learn very quickly. I, I noticed in Crohn's disease patients that some of them would, well, how many people know what Crohn's disease is? Quite a few, okay. So it's an autoimmune disease of the gut where the immune system is undergoing friendly fire against the lining of the gut because somehow uh, the gut lining cells have gotten fingerprinted by the immune system and, and now are under attack. And so these Crohn's patients would be going along doing just fine, and they'd get a course of antibiotics for something, and their disease would flare. And then in eight weeks or 10 weeks or so, they would gradually settle back down. There'd be other people who are going along smoldering, hard to control, not doing very well, and they'd get a course of antibiotics for something else, and their disease would go into remission for eight weeks. And so that tells us that in the person who flared with antibiotics when they were well, the antibiotics were killing off something that was important to keeping whatever the immune system was riled up about under, under wraps. And the person who's sick and you kill off the bacteria that the immune system is riled up about and they go into remission. And so it takes, uh, and I made this observation, I, I, I don't know any study that I can quote about it, but it taught me that the bacteria that are there, are, what's important to one person or is a problem is not necessarily what's for the other person, even though all of it is about having the right bacteria and the immune system that's tolerant and has learned what to tolerate. So um, we're going to be looking at the changes that cause uh, Alzheimer's and the changes that cause Parkinson's. If you go to, I showed you some video clips from from Dr. Michael Grieger, and that was nutritionfacts.org. And he has 1,800 three-minute videos in his archives that are turning science ready for prime time into lay language with academic references. If you go there and you look up Parkinson's disease, there will be 10 or 15 video clips summarizing everything from food to bacteria to herbal supplements and, and beha other behavior things. And so um, this is going to be very important. There's, there's uh, people that have a tendency toward diarrhea all the time. And uh, there, we now know that there are bacteria that promote rapid uh, motility in the intestine. And there are people that don't go for three weeks at a time. And we know that there are bacteria that slow down uh, motility. So this is, this is a frontier. This is brand new stuff that will re require that we rethink everything. You said you have to rethink one thing? Yeah, that's for tonight. <laughs> Tomorrow it's a new list. Uh, so all I can say is stay tuned. We are all wide-eyed and alert about the role of the microbiome in everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, 
One of the perspectives that I sort of gathered as an outsider looking into the microbiome world and the medical world and its applications um, was that I think in many ways we're kind of in that area in the place that uh, ecology and natural history was sometime between the time of Linnaeus and Darwin in the sense that we're starting to put together the names and the ideas of maybe some of the key players, but we really don't know that much about their ecological interactions. And if we think about the human digestive tract as a series of ecosystems that are inhabited by a multitude of species, an incredible diversity of species, how is it that they interact with each other? Which are the key players? How do they change contextually? If some disappear, does that make others behave differently? What are the sort of the, the situational contexts in which the same microbe may play different roles depending on who it's sharing space with? Mm. We know that matters in terms of macroscopic ecology. And we also know, like, what would we know about the ecology of Australia if all we knew about was koalas? You know, we'd have a very limited view, and yet with, with the microbial world, the cultural world of microbes is what, like 1% or something of maybe of what is there? That's probably not all that off my koala and Australia analogy. Um, and so I, I think you're right that we're basically going to have to, or maybe not me since I'm a geologist, <laughs> I won't have to be rethinking this, but the people actively engaged in that kind of research I think are going to be moving into thinking about ecological interactions among organisms that are very difficult to study. And so it's going to be very interesting to see what comes together in terms of sorting through causal and associative connections um, with connecting microbial influences on particular um, diseases. I think a lot of progress has been made, and the, but the thing that gives me some, well, the thing I was really impressed by in putting the hidden half of nature together with Anne was how clear the message of some of the most effective preventative things that we can do, the kind of things around a plant-based diet that we were all sort of talking about over the last um, few days. Um, we don't necessarily have to understand all the ecological interactions between all the players to start thinking about, well, what are some smart ways to reform practices? And we could still learn a lot more as we go. I think next 20, 30 years, it'll probably take a while. Um, even with the fast and furious pace of that research today, to really figure out all the connections um, viewed through the lens of microbial ecology rather than germ theory. So compared to 200 years ago when it comes to seeds and soil and farming and our guts, um, it seems like a lot of the stuff we were doing 200 years ago was probably way, way more logical than it is today, but we have a lot more people. So at this point, knowing everything you know and knowing how much gentler we were on the planet 200 years ago, but knowing that we have a big population now, if you were fully in charge of all the countries, including the United States, and you, your decisions were final, when it comes to seeds and farming and our gut health, what are the specific policies that you would put in place to resolve and move us forward in a positive way? Uh. God, I get to play God. That's cool. Okay. Goddess. Can I love you? <laughs> Bring me your needs. I'll take care of them. Um, so in my talk, I talked about this study that was done that is really, really impressive because the answer has been validated by science. It's called the, Interna it's called the International Assessment of Agriculture Science. And I'll give you the AA. It's called I... If you want to look it up, it's IAASTD, the International Assessment of Agricultural Science and Technology for Development. Okay, and what this happened was like 400 highly regarded experts, they did peer review studies, they, they did the top quality science all over the world, 110 countries. And when they came out with the result, 58 countries validated, signed on, said this is the way to go. And basically, this one word that you need to remember is called agroecology. Okay? I love it that David's nodding. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and if you don't know what it is, I highly um, encourage you to find out about what agroecology is. Because if we're talking about systems, we're talking about taking this linear thinking that created the industrial system, created genetic engineering. You know, what are engineers? They want to go from A to B, right? Okay, what is life? Life is cyclical, it's diverse, it's crazy, it does all kinds of things we don't understand. So that's, you know, a system. 
right? And we, it's chaotic, and we don't understand it, and, and we have this need to understand it. I mean, we've been talking about knowledge. I, I really would like to give a pitch for humility, you know? I think that if we could approach these problems with this real grounded sense that we don't know, here's what we do know, here's what we understand, here's what we'd like to have happen, let's try it out carefully. In Europe, they... Um, um, they're, they're more likely to use what they call the precautionary principle, which is a preventative way of saying, look, if, you, if, if we really don't think it's safe, we probably shouldn't do it. So there are, there are so many good ideas and really validated models for both law and knowledge and practices that, that you, we can bring into this discussion to say, how do we change the system that we, we know is not working, that's really hurting ourselves and hurting the planet? Um, and in, in, in terms of agriculture just alone, the IAASTD talks about local production, but the, the, you're always dealing with scale. You're always dealing with scale. You have to, you can, get, you can get new models of production that fit in one area. You have to understand, you know, how can we scale that up, make it a little bit more economically productive for the regional farmers, things like that. So these are questions that have to be solved. If, um, in my book I talked about, when they talked about um, the creation of genetically engineered seeds, if they'd spent a fraction of the money that they've spent on genetic technologies and chemicals alone and put it into ecological answers, we would have these answers at hand, they'd be the practices. But unfortunately, because of the political situation, we've diverted our, our, our best interests and our, and our um, resources towards technological answers. So I say, I said in my talk, I'm going to give you an easy way to think about it. If you want to evaluate where we're headed, we have this biological model. Like I said, nature finds the answers. We can work with our nature, our better nature, and, they, and the natural world to find the answers that we need. Or we can go biotechnology and have this very limited engineered, very limited linear view of how to come up with solutions that, re, that basically are private, patented, commercial solutions and very limited, you know, there's, they're, they're for a li very limited uses. I, you know, I oppose them, but I can understand why people think that it might, might have been a good idea. But it's a very small view of the world. So we can broaden our view of the world, broaden our view of what's possible, open up our minds to other ways of knowing, other ways of doing things, and come up with better solutions and, and lose these other models that are out there. The reason you, and I speak as now as a journalist, the reason you have not heard of them is because journalism is not doing its job of informing people. And uh, that's another topic. <laughs> yes. yes. And that's not limited to this topic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a problem. Yes. Um, I guess the, the first thing that I want to do in, in responding to following up to that and to responding to the question is to point out that 200 years ago it was farming practices that really drove the American colonists west over the Appala Appalachians. Why? Well, they exhausted the soils of the eastern seaboard. So the idea is not simply to go back to some idyllic way that agriculture was in the past because we've used those techniques in the past and they have not proven sustainable. Now, there's other examples in some places where there's fields that have been farmed for thousands of years using sustainable approaches. Those weren't the ones that made it to the American colonies, um, but that's sort of a longer thing I go through in the book uh, uh, as well. It's a beautiful part of your book, actually. Oh, thank really you. Well done. Um, but so I think if we look towards the future, and if you're asking me to put sort of the hat on of what policies would I recommend, the idea of agroecology, I was nodding my head because I actually agree, that is very much the way forward. Yeah. Uh, thinking about how to actually implement that and how to do it in different settings for different crops in different parts of the world with different kinds of soils is going to take a major research effort. And I completely agree with the idea in terms of we've made some society, societal level the amount of resources we've invested into proprietary technologies for agriculture greatly swamps the ones where I think we really need to make the public investments okay. in terms of uh, how to operationalize agroecological principles and techniques for both small farms and I actually think very large farms because I think it's feasible to do so. Um, and how would you do that? Um, I, there's a lot of different ways to argue about how to go forward on that, but there's uh, some methods that are referred to loosely as conservation agriculture that I think provide a way to go forward, particularly in thinking about some of the larger um, farms. 
that still needs some research uh, needs. But the combination of three elements of don't disturb the soil surface, um, either going for no-till or low disturbance agriculture, um, growing cover crops so the ground is not bare and vulnerable to erosion and so you can actually get legumes to bring uh, nitrogen back into the soil um, and to scavenge other nutrients and um, and also diversifying crop rotations. One of the big problems that have led to the overuse of both herbicides and pesticides are the habit of like planting corn, soy, corn, soy in a regular predictable sequence on the same piece of ground over and over again and guess what? The pests and pathogens adapt. Um, and fairly rapidly. Uh, I was just out visiting some farmers in South Dakota a few uh, weeks ago who've gone to some very large acreages, not to completely organic, but to very, very low chemical input um, by basically following those techniques, going to no-till, going to cover crops, and diversifying the rotation so it's not a predictable rotation and they get sort of a diversity of crops. On The thing that I was very amazed by is that they've literally sort of shut off the erosion problem but they've also improved their own bottom line. They're making more money doing it. They're spending less on the inputs and they're getting just as much output. And there's this transition period, but they've sort of gone through it and they're really happy with it and they're doing better than their neighbors. And I think therein lies a, you know, a cause for, an arguable cause for optimism is that if we can get the kind of methods developed and to farmers so that they can see the benefit not just to their own land, but also to the bottom line on their farm, you get those two things to line up, they love doing the right thing by their land. They know their land. They pay attention to it. They've seen a lot of the changes to it. They really, many of them, most of the ones I've talked to, and again, I may be talking to a biased subset, but they really care about their land. But they also have to stay in business as farmers. Um, getting those two things to line up is, I think, a major societal challenge that if you're asking me to redirect policy, a huge research effort aimed at generating non-proprietary techniques uh, for pushing the bounds of the application of agroecology forward to be, will be very high on my list. Um, a number of the farmers I've also talked to have basically said that one of the best things that can be done to agricultural policy is just eliminate all the subsidies. Because then farming techniques that actually take care of the land would prosper over the long run. And these are the farmers that are giving me that idea. I, but. Well, I, we, uh, let's reform the subsidies, shall we? we? We eliminate a lot of them, especially the production, but let's, let's, help, let's continue to subsidize public, public plant breeding, public yeah. uh, research programs. I would public, argue we should uh, be subsidizing things that are in the long-term public interest. There you go. And that's not what we've been doing. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So let's reform them and maybe we could cut them way, way, way down. I agree. <laughs> yes. I think we underestimate our own power and the role that we play. When we started teaching uh, therapeutic lifestyle change in Rockford, uh, and we were going to drink almond milk instead of uh, cow's milk, we all knew which store had almond milk, right? Now we go to any grocery store and there's six or seven kinds of almond milk, but only one of them, Pacifica, is organic. It's organic. And so, so we got them to go from one to six or seven, now we'll start getting them to go to oh, one of those being organic to more of them being organic. So we have the power of the purse and we now have the power of things going viral. Uh, we, we can create an infectious spread of lifestyle medicine um, and uh, the marketplace will respond. And so don't, don't underestimate our power along with policy and along with joining organizations that call us and then offer to connect us, uh, it's very hopeful. Just th one thought about 200 years ago, Stephen, um, because I was thinking about, I can't remember exactly when Rudolf Steiner started uh, looking at, uh, pardon? Early 1900s. Early 1900s. Sort of one of the, if you look at the beginnings of organic, the, or what we know now as the organic farming movement, it started with the idea of what are these chemicals that we're starting to do. At that time, it was mostly fertilizers and, and herbicides, but um, it's, of course, expanded into the tremendous array of, of toxic chemicals we're now using in agriculture. But the, back at the time, they was looking at what they were finding, and so the first beginning of that was the nutritional profile of the foods that were being produced that way had been seriously degraded. And um, we've, we have a lot of information about different farming practices and how that does. But I think 200 years ago, I'd, I'd like to know what the cancer rate was then 
because uh, I, I totally agree with you about the farming practices and that wasn't as good. But in some ways, that, ha that I, I'm certain that the food that was being produced at that time was probably far more nutritious uh, than it is now. This morning, Robert Glennon uh, spoke about water shortages. And um, it's a very relevant topic because California is going through a drought and a lot of people are paying attention. However, if he gave the lecture 10 years ago, a lot of people would have thought this is not worth the time because this isn't a real issue. It's a topic that I read about a lot that I find very disturbing, but it's still, it's in the news constantly, but it still fortunately hasn't become a major news story. And that would be the topic of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Does your work with soil, with seeds, with gut bacteria have anything to say about antibiotic resistant bacteria? Is there anything that you want to say about that? Well, I did write an article about the study that was done in China where antibiotic resistant marker bacteria, this is recombinant bacteria now, and we're not talking about bacteria that's the runoff, the antibiotic resistant mar uh, bacteria that is um, in runoff from farms, because that's been the great, one of the greatest uh, sources, I believe, of antibiotic resistance is its overuse in agriculture. But in this case, there were six rivers in China that had uh, recombinant DNA, the, um, the um, plasmid vectors that are used in genetically engineered organisms. They use antibiotic resistant markers to create genetically modified organisms. And those antibiotic resistant markers are in the rivers. If you don't understand that, I hope you will explain how the mechanism of that works. Um, I'm not a scientist, but I was very much alarmed by this because uh, the more we're overusing anything, including, including genetically modified organisms and getting them out there, the more we're affecting in very unpredictable ways um, the life forms on the earth. And so in these article, they said they're expanding it. Um, uh, and now that it's in the river, so it's in the drinking water. So it's, you know, it's really much, you know, it gets, it gets uh, spread out all over. You know, the antibiotic resistance that we're, we're finding now is probably the number one health problem in the world. Some people have said that. Uh, I read one article that said that, was it 15,000 or 25,000 people die a year in Europe? from antibiotic resistant, um, from diseases that are antibiotic resistant. So, this, so, so the resistance to antibiotics, we're losing this really powerful tool that we've had over the last 60 years. I wouldn't be here, I got, I got pneumonia when I was six. And I hate to tell you, but that was just about when the antibiotics <laughs> were beginning. And um, penicillin saved my life. Um, but, you know, so I, I'm, I'm not against the use of antibiotics, but it's the overuse in agriculture to get p animals fat, to, uh, to deal with the problems of overcrowding. These are practices that could be changed. You don't need to, um, and, and, and you don't need to, ha to, to you know, cure the problem by, you know, curing the diseases that the problem causes, if that makes sense. The other thing I wanted to say about, the, about agricultural biotechnology, again, the, the, I've always said that this is an invention in search of a necessity. Because it doesn't, the, you don't, you can solve the problem. You don't need to treat it with this particular technological solution. And one of them was they were growing, I, I wrote an article for uh, World Watch on uh, rice that was being grown in Northern California under the Pacific Flyway where all the wonderful birds and their, and their migrations go back and forth. We're talking millions of birds go by. They were growing rice, antibiotic, I mean they were scary, growing rice with human genes in it. And the human genes that they used were from tear ducts and breast milk because they're, those are antimicrobial. So they took those antimicrobial genes from, from those two sources put them in the rice, and they were growing them out in the open air. So the birds were able, and while, why were they doing that? Because they wanted that rice to have that antimicrobial property so they could put it into the feed for the overcrowded poultry industry to solve the pathogens in that. So they didn't ever consider not having overcrowded poultry, right? So there you go. We done? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Yeah, we're done.
No, 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 please. Would you explain how antibiotic resistance works, in, like even in the Well, the, the, the bacteria, somebody said just today that the, I guess it was Joel Furman was saying that the life cycle of some bacteria is six hours, or that they start d doubling in, in six hours. That seemed awfully fast to me, but, but they do uh, grow fast. If you think about an infection that you've had and it's spreading through your body, uh, and it spreads because of an increasing number of bacteria, not one bacteria racing around making every organ sick. It's, it's growing in number and spreading. And uh, so, you, so you think about how fast they grow and that they can adapt quickly and that they share genetic information with each other. Mm -hmm. I think uh, David was talking about that this morning. And we hear all this talk every now and then it crops up about bird flu. And, and they say, well, bird flu is, you know, it's in the animal kingdom and it's not in humans. And, but, oh, if, if there would be just a little genetic change. And so then we are, are growing rice with human mm -hmm. uh, genes in them that is going to be eaten by birds. Right. And, and so you, you, so the, this, this exchange of genetic material is supposed to happen in some situations and not in others. And I don't fully understand that. But... Um, the, 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 the bacteria just need a period of time exposed to any block to them and they will learn a way around it. And so there's that problem and then the C. diff problem. How many people in the room understand what C. diff is? Well, C. diff is the name of a bacteria, Clostridia difficile. And it's uh, Dr. Furman, or was it you, David, that showed a picture of a mix of bacteria, and there's a little orange C. diff here, and there was one over there, and there was a mm. sea of a variety, diversity of bacteria. And then when someone gets an antibiotic, particularly clindamycin, it'll kill off 25, 30, 40 percent of those bacteria, and C. diff is just waiting to grow. One of the suppressors of bad bacteria is good bacteria. And bad bacteria are not easily killed. And good bacteria die with a whiff of antibiotics. So what is suppressing the bad is very sensitive and vulnerable and needs to be there in great diversity. So if one is gone, another takes over faster than C. diff can grow. But when C. diff overgrows, it secretes a, a toxin that can make the bowel so sick that the people have to have a colectomy, take out the entire colon, throw it away in order to save them. Now we know all we need to do is give them a stool transplant from a relative in the same house that they live in. And you were saying is maybe 90% effective, maybe 99% effective. Wow. All, wow. Uh, so fecal transplants, transplants are being researched frantically now because if you could make them in the pleasant pill, <laughs> Uh, they will be used to correct uh, flora, uh, the flora in our guts so that we don't have the one that supports Parkinson's or we don't have the one that supports lupus or we don't have the ones that support Crohn's. So this is an industry that's coming. This pharmaceutical industry, industry is salivating over, feces, uh, over, <laughs> over bacteria. Uh, uh, and I have a great cartoon of a dog, you know, dogs have strange behaviors. Yeah. Some of them in the winter time not, are looking not for icicles, <clears throat> but for poopsicles. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. So this dog is smelling this little pile of stool and is saying, hmm, I smell firmicutes and bacteroides. Think I'll take the cure. Uh, and, and that's what we're coming to. But, but the problem of, of bacterial uh, resistance is that uh, they know how to survive. And we have to learn to work with them, not against them. Right. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, I have an article here on, <laughs> that says, don't panic, go organic. The IPC report should be a wake-up call for climate smart food. And it basically talks about four climate smart food strategies to help with global warming. And one is to reduce food waste, one is to protect the oceans, one is to grow and eat food that's real food, and one of them is to guard the soil. And it talks about how the soil is a strategy to protect against climate change. It says across the planet, ecosystems on the land, soil, forest, prairies, about 
absorb about one-third of the greenhouse gases humans emit each year. Through, through protecting forests is often presented as a frontline strategy, strategy to reduce emissions. Soil, soil stores even more carbon than our forests. Healthy soils, therefore, are essential in absorbing already emitted carbon dioxide. What's more, industrial agricultural practices now going global, including synthetic fertilizer, monocropping, chemical use, and tillage, destroy soil carbon, releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Much of the farmland across our Midwest that had levels of 20% carbon as recently as the 1950s now contain only 1% or 2%, according to the Pennsylvania-based Rodale Institute. And it goes on. Do you want to speak about how the soil is a strategy, keeping the soil good is a strategy for protecting against climate change? Um, sure, I can uh, speak to that a little bit. The, um, not a lot of people know that uh, back in 1978, there was a study that showed that about one-third of the CO2 that had been added uh, to the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution actually came from plowing up the plains, um, and not just in North America, but in Asia and in uh, Eastern Europe as well. Mm. Um, and what happens is you, if there's a lot of organic matter in the soil, when the soil gets uh, plowed up, some of it gets oxidized. Um, and the soil organic matter content of the world's agricultural soils have gone down a lot over the last 150 years or so. Um, now, if we had strategies to put organic matter back on the land to either retain crop stubble and sort of keep harvesting part of the organic matter that we're growing on our fields or even bring organic matter back to the land, you could arguably, arguably increase soil organic matter contents fairly dramatically over some period of decades and depending on the practices and the crops and the region and the climate and all that. Um, but if you look at the total amount of carbon that's stored in the world of soils, it's about twice what's in the atmosphere. Um, the soil is a really big reservoir for carbon. And it can hold a lot more than it has in it today. It's lost a lot, as I said, in the last couple hundred years. We could actually start thinking in terms of our regenerative agricultural practices that I was talking about earlier. What's one of the best things you could do to restore the native fertility to soils? It's increasing the soil organic carbon content. Why? Well, because that is part of the food for all the microbial life that I was talking about this morning that is actually the natural engine for fertility. So here you have an example of something where you know, the same action trying to rebuild the carbon content in soils will not only help us rebuild the native fertility of soils, but it will also help sequester carbon. Um, that's kind of a thing where it's, it's a two for one, in effect. Um, it's a fairly rational thing to try and do. There's, there's different estimates of how much carbon could actually be parked in the world's soils, and, it, and they range from fairly low to fairly high. I'll spare you the sort of the numbers. It depends really what you're willing to assume about the nature of agricultural practices, how they may change, how efficient they are, and what kind of means you're using to try and get carbon back into the soil. Um, but in terms of just a, a potential strategy for actually helping to reduce the potential impact from increases in atmospheric CO2, you know, that's one strategy where we could be doing that anyway simply to rebuild soil fertility. Um, the, the, carbon, the, the climate aspect to it could either be viewed as the primary driver if you're most worried about that or as just a nice bonus if you're more worried about soil fertility. So a friend of mine, John Wicks, is a, um, a farmer in my county called uh, Marin County, California, and we were kind of a grass-fed um, agriculture there. So we have a lot of pasture management. We have a lot, most of it's organic dairies. But uh, he wanted to find out, were there pasturing practices that would sequester carbon? So he started changing the way cows were allowed to graze. And he, he set up these different fields, and he partnered up with UC Berkeley and started measuring. And I went out there to write about this, and he, and he measured, he, it, technically, and has done some good peer-reviewed study now that shows um, that uh, he increased the carbon sequestration of the grasses. He was using native grasses, but he basically did it by, um, by not allowing the cows free range. Uh, they, they were located in one area, and then they deposit, speaking of your other subject there, <laughs> they, they deposit their, their waste on the field, and that's a big part of it. But then he also composts that. So he had a composting um, and a grazing technique, which increased 
the carbon by any, uh, quite a bit. I, I'm sorry, I can't give you the numbers. But basically what John said was that he felt, and I can't, and I'm not saying this has been validated by science, but he felt that they could take out all the legacy carbon as well as all the new carbon that was going into the air and that just changing pasturing and grazing techniques would make a significant impact on climate change in wherever they were introduced. So if you want to look that up, I can give you the resource for that. And the other person I want to mention that I write about in my book is Wes Jackson um, at the Land Institute in Kansas. And uh, he has a wonderful picture on their website which shows most of the way grasses that are, you know, used in industrial agriculture and their roots are about like this, this long, right? And then he has the perennial grasses of the prairie and, and you have to stand up and hold, you, you've seen this picture, you have to stand up and hold it because it's like many, many, many like feet so long. long. Yeah, it's just this yeah. glorious this glorious thing. Who was it at this conference that talked, was it you that talked about the roots as the digestive system? Of the, oh, that was beautiful. I love these analogies. Um, but, um, but these roots are what we need, you know, so we need to go deep-rooted. We need to go deeply rooted agriculture would be it. So the political fix for this, I'm going to go back to this, is to fix the farm bill and to start putting the research money and start putting the conservation practices into our subsidies and, and correct the problem. It's a pretty darn easy fix, actually. People do know what to do. It's just that the people who want to do something else are in charge. Uh, I have a question for the panel. <laughs> um, and this may be a bit tangential, but um, what about hydroponics? And what about this food tower we see here uh, in our midst, which is plants growing in just water and sunlight or even artificial light? Is this um, helpful in some of these problems of running out of soil that we've been talking about? Is it sort of a, a way of saving us till we figure out uh, how to grow the soil back? Or are there positives and negatives to this kind of food production? You want to go first? Oh, um, I have friends that know people who, grow, who have a, a fish farm in their bathtub in the cities. You know, I think wherever you can grow food's a good idea. You just be clever about it. This is all really good. Growing food is wonderful. It's, it's um, fun for kids to do. Just do it wherever you can. But I don't think, it's, I don't think it addresses the soil problem at all. So I like, I, like, I like ideas. I think they're very good. I think if you want to grow something, you should do it, even if it means growing mold on your food in your refrigerators. But... <laughs> eventually put them in your compost pile and get them out into the dirt. And I sneak food out into, into commercial areas. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, get to, get the, take the wrapper off your lunch and put it under a tree, you know? I mean, just give the worth a hand once in a while. We can, so do, we, do, we can do both. It's, I, I, either or thinking is not going to help us in this case, I think. Yeah, I mean, what the, in terms of a downside to hydroponics, you still need to get the nutrients from somewhere. So, ah, good point. I was thinking water and sunlight's not enough. Well, yeah, water, and so you, it, depending on how you get the minerals, uh, what kind of energy you need to actually run the facility, the energetics may or may not pan out. But you still, if you're bringing in, well, it depends where you're getting the other nutrients is actually a big question. And so for some crops in some circumstances, or for small-scale home production, it could make a lot of sense. And, turn, and I think that urban agriculture has a future to play in agriculture. Yeah. But what form that's going to take, may not really be clear yet in terms of how, well, I mean, the two things that, well, one thing that we have a surplus of in the urban environment uh, is organic waste. Um, you know, we produce a lot of it, uh, both from the food we don't eat and also from the food we do eat, to go back to that subject. Um, and what we do with it now in terms of taking a very rich nutrient source and basically flushing it to the sea is kind of crazy in the large scale view of things. And so one of the things I think we're gonna have to rethink over the next century or two is how to close the nutrient loop to actually get the nutrients that are we're processing through cities back out to the rural environment, or maybe integrating them into urban farms. Um, but we need to have a discussion at a societal level about what to do with our waste stream. Because um, if we go back 200 years, it was totally different than it is today. We can be sure that 200 years from now, it'll be totally different. But we ought to be approaching it in a very rational way to, to take advantage of the opportunity as we update infrastructure to actually make sure we're starting to close the nutrient loop that has to be the foundation for any truly long-term sustainable agriculture. Wonderful. If, if we're eating simple carbs and that's bad for us and complex carbs are good for us, 
but they're all made of carbon. Uh, if we recycle or compost the waste from a fast food restaurant, is that a good thing or is that making bad compost? Is that before or after you eat it? <laughs> we'll take before first. I don't have an opinion on that. Um, <laughs> All waste is good. I mean, one, one of the issues that I've uh, run across concern about in terms of composting urban waste is what about all the pharmaceuticals and, and other things that are in what we, what, that come out after we take them in. Um, and some of the people I've talked to who have been running sort of large-scale composting operations basically have been doing the studies that show that if you compost right, that stuff all gets broken down. Even the antibiotics get broken down. They may kill some of the microbes in the composting, but then they get broken down and metabolized themselves. And so I, I think that, again, we're back to sort of figuring out methods and techniques to actually adapt that and do that at, at scale. Um, but that there's ways to do it that um, we'd be wise to, to look into and try and take advantage of. Are you familiar with the work of Paul Stamets? Yes. Yeah, and so let's give a shout out for mushrooms in the fungal nation because they um, have turned out, because one of the things that's been the most difficult is like diesel and radioactive waste and some of these other, and so I had a kind of a snarky comment there, all waste is good, but it's true that there's gonna always be a natural response, which is why it's kind of interesting and fun to think about these issues. And, and he has discovered certain fungal, fungi, fun, he's a fungi, um, fungi that will, uh, de will recycle and uh, degrade and renew uh, almost everything that we consider toxic now. So for every problem, there's a natural solution. A oh. Um, you know what, I'm gonna, we're gonna wrap up. So just let me ask you one final quick question. Um, I have a, article from Natural Society that says new study, organic farms support 34 to 43 percent more species than GMO farms. There's a lot of articles and books about species extinction, um, talking about how we're losing species. A lot of the people that I know in my regular life don't talk about this, don't think about it, don't read about it, I don't see it in the newspaper. Is this a big deal? Like, what we, so what's, you know, we have a lot of species, so what's the big deal if we lose 80% of them. <laughs> well, I, I'm sure the dinosaurs wouldn't appreciate our being in control now. Um, we're living through, what is it, the sixth major um, yeah. extinction that yeah. the world's happened, but this one is being caused primarily by our activity. And if you look back, you know, a million years from now, if somebody looked back at the geologic record we're producing now, it will look like an instantaneous event. It'll look like the thing, the, the bolide or the comet, the, whatever it was that actually wiped out the dinosaurs. Um, so is this a big deal or not? Well, you know, I think there's several ways to look at that, but they all point to, yes, it's a big deal, and that is utterly independent of whether or not you think it's a big deal morally and ethically to actually be, in effect, in charge of the environmental conditions in this world, which collectively we are at this point, we're running the show, um, and to have that kind of event happen on our watch. Um, the And to, in, in regard to the study that you were mentioning, I mean, if you think about how much of the world's surface area we actually use for agriculture, it's one of our dominant land uses. In many ways, for the foreseeable future, the future of biology and biodiversity on this planet is going to be fundamentally linked and tied into the style of agriculture we practice. And so to the degree to which our farms are biodiverse, that's going to translate into the preservation of species um, globally. Uh, so I think it's actually a huge deal, and you're right, it is the part of this whole issue that doesn't receive as much attention as food production or uh, chemical use in farms. But I think if we look into that, a lot of the techniques that are being developed in terms of agroecological techniques to solve problems that we have in agriculture with a little different thinking and application of applied ecology um, actually lead to greater biodiversity on farms like that study sounds to be showing, I'm not familiar with that particular study, but there's been others that have shown similar kinds of things. Um, and dating back to, like, uh, was it, Lewis, Lewis Bromfield's uh, Pleasant Valley, written in the 1940s, has wonderful descriptions of pretty much the same thing. You said 80%? What would you say, how many? The, um, 
That one said like 35 to 45 percent. Okay, well, so will 35 to 40 percent of you please leave the room? I mean, that's what we're looking at, right? But we don't notice it because it's species that we're not, we're not feeling related to. I mean, we know each other. We can look around the room and see each other right now. But, um, but the 40 percent that's missing, we're not seeing that. So what I want to say is that we, you know, I'd like, I'm always thinking about how we're thinking about this. And, and it's this idea that we're separate. We're separate from these other species. We're separate from the gut biome or the microbial, you know, the invisible world or the distant world or the abstract world. We're not, we are not separate. You know, this is, this is very important that we understand we're all part of a system. We're interdependent beings. And that if we can, begin to ch we can begin to see ourselves as part of that, then we're not, I'm not going to ask you to leave in order to save you know, the, my consuming lifestyle, right? Because that's what we're doing. We're saying, well, we can sacrifice these other species because I want to eat at McDonald's or something. Um, I hate to sound kind of pedantic about that, but it's really what it comes down to is, is that our, we, ha we are willing to believe this inconvenient lie, or the convenient lie, right? instead of the inconvenient truth. And it takes guts, it really, <laughs> speaking of guts, it really takes a lot. <laughs> it takes a strong, healthy immune system to be able to resist these, this, this disillusion and this disconnection that we're really actually faced with. And, and like I said in my talk yesterday, there's only one way to do that, and it's like holding each other's hands or reaching out and realizing that all species are related and that we're interrelated and that the health of one involves the health of the other. All these sort of conceptual ideas that are, that are pleasing to hear are actually, actually the real reality. It's that reality that we need to re just remember. You know, one of the reasons I really welcome working with traditional people is that one of the jobs they have on earth is to remember. And to remember means to put things back together. Their ceremonies are often, you know, about putting, holding the world together, keeping the world in balance. And what that's about is about really knowing that we're in this together. And that, and that we can't ask. We can't ask the soil to be sterile so that we can have this form of agriculture that's cheap food. Because that, that's not where it comes from. It comes from a, the, the, these, other, these other political conditions we've been talking about. So, um, so I I'm a big believer in the invisible world, making it more visible by how we behave, by how we talk, and, um, and, and reducing that sense of separation that keeps us apart. So it's been a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Stephen. It's been great to be with you. Okay, David, Claire, Roger, thank you so much. I'm very grateful you all came and shared all your wisdom